Federal Bureau of Investigation's Behavioural Science Unit, featured on TV shows like Mindhunter, developed the field of criminal profiling, that is, studying and reviewing the details of a crime to make inferences on the characteristics and personality of the likely offender. In 1980, American criminologist Roy Hazelwood developed the concepts of organised and disorganised serial killers while working at the FBI. Today we're going to look at what these categories actually mean. A killer who fits into the organised category will typically be highly intelligent and meticulous in the ways they plan and prepare for their crimes. They will likely bring tools or their weapon of choice with them and will often stay to clean up afterwards to prevent any evidence being left behind. They take great pride in their crimes and it's common for organised killers to select and then stalk their potential victims for several days in order to decipher their routine and determine whether they will be a good target. For an organised killer, the preparation element is almost as important as the act of murdering itself because these killers can often spend years developing their fantasy of how the crime will play out. With organised offenders, there are typically three separate crime scene locations per murder. The first is where the victim is approached and or taken. The second is where the victim is killed. And the third is where the victim's body is disposed of. Not only does this allow the killer to maintain a sense of control, but it also makes it more difficult for the police to collect the necessary evidence to identify their killer. All three locations are typically far away from the killer's home and place of work, but are still familiar enough for them to feel comfortable using it as part of their crime. Due to their high levels of intelligence, organised killers tend to have an easier time blending into society and masking their criminality from those closest to them. They are often married or live with a partner, are educated and employed, and despite being functional members of society, these killers are likely to show antisocial and psychopathic traits. Organised killers are also more likely to insert themselves into the investigation or pay close attention to news stories and media coverage of their crimes because it gives them satisfaction and a sense of superiority over the police who are investigating them. An example of an organised killer is Ted Bundy. Born in 1946, he was raised primarily by his grandparents. He achieved high grades at school and went on to study psychology and law at university, where he was well liked by his professors. He developed various romantic relationships, including with a fellow student, Diane Edwards, where they even discussed marriage. However, they would soon break up. He used his charismatic personality to gain employment as the assistant to the chairman of the Washington State Republican Party at the time. It's not known exactly when Ted Bundy began committing serious criminal acts, but it is believed to be in the early 1970s. His first series of crimes consisted of breaking and entering into victims' homes late at night, followed by a violent attack with a blunt object. Over time, Ted Bundy became more sophisticated in the ways he committed these crimes. He would wear fake plaster casts on his leg and ask potential victims to assist him into his car, where he would have his weapon of choice, typically a crowbar, hidden inside ready for use. He would then transport his victim to a pre-selected secondary location, where he would strangle them with a ligature. Ted Bundy would move around frequently abducting and killing women while travelling through Washington, Utah, Idaho, Colorado and Florida. During his time in Washington, Bundy is known to have used a dump site on Taylor Mountain, close to where he would often go hiking. In total, the partial skeletal remains of four young women were discovered there along the hillside next to Washington State Route 18. His decision to stop using this particular location is interesting and could indicate that he was trying to switch up his methods as a way to further impede any investigation or that something might have spooked him, leaving him worried that he had been seen. Once he was caught and incarcerated, he was interviewed by FBI profilers where he eventually confessed to killing 30 women, although the total could be higher. The FBI developed a summary of Ted Bundy's MO, which shares a lot of features to an organised killer. 
All of his victims fit the same profile as they were white females. Most of them were from middle class families and the majority were college students. He often drank alcohol prior to finding a victim. He avoided the use of firearms because of the noise they caused and the ballistic evidence that would have been left behind. Instead, he would lure potential victims to his car before hitting them on the head. All but one victim was found to have been strangled. He meticulously researched his surroundings to find safe places to both take and dispose of victims. Most victims were dumped far away from where they had disappeared from, and he was forensically aware and never left a fingerprint at any crime scene. While these traits certainly made it difficult for the police to investigate and capture Ted Bundy, in the end it was his own arrogance that got him caught. In 1978, he was pulled over by a Pensacola police officer for driving a stolen vehicle. When the car was searched, they found three sets of IDs and credit cards belonging to his victims who were from Florida State University. At the other end of the spectrum are disorganised killers. Their crimes are rarely planned beforehand. Instead, they usually act on an opportunistic impulse with victims who just happen to cross their path. Due to their lack of foresight, they often rely on improvised weapons or objects that are nearby. These killers are often antisocial and isolated, live alone, and rarely have any close friends, family or romantic relationships. They are likely to report being in a confused and distressed state of mind at the time of the murders, and often have serious mental health issues. A killer of the disorganised kind typically has below average intelligence and will have experienced some form of abuse during childhood at the hands of a close relative. These killers often commit blitz attacks. They use sudden and overwhelming force to disorientate their victims, resulting in extreme violence and overkill. Due to the impulsivity of a disorganised killer, there is often no attempt to move or conceal the victim, nor to clean up the scene or any evidence that they may have left behind. Herbert Mullen is a good example of a disorganised killer. Though he had a very typical childhood, he did experience a traumatic event that affected him greatly. In the summer of 1965, Mullen's best friend was killed in a car crash. From this point on, his behaviour changed dramatically. He built shrines to his friend in his bedroom and became obsessed by reincarnation, religion and impending natural disasters. Mullen's distorted beliefs and declining mental health were compounded by his excessive use of LSD and marijuana. By the time he was in his mid-twenties, he had been admitted into several mental health hospitals and was eventually diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. In October 1972, Mullen bludgeoned a homeless man, 55-year-old Lawrence White, with a baseball bat and later claimed that he believed Lawrence White was Jonah from the Bible and had sent him telepathic messages telling Mullen to kill him. In a separate incident on the 24th of October, Mullen offered a ride to a young student, 24-year-old Mary Margaret Guilfoyle. Not long after she entered his vehicle, he stabbed her in the chest and back in a frenzied attack while he was still driving. Still struggling with his mental health, Mullen attended St Mary's Catholic Church in Los Gatos on November the 2nd. Mullen would later claim that the priest in the confessional, Father Henry Tomé, had volunteered to be his next sacrifice. Mullen kicked and stabbed the father to death before fleeing. On January 25th, 1973, Mullen decided to locate his old high school friend, Jim Ralph, who had originally introduced him to marijuana. Due to his ill mental health and distorted thinking, Mullen blamed all of his current issues on Jim. When Mullen travelled to Jim's last known address, the current occupant, Kathy Francis, gave him Jim's new address. Once there, he shot Jim and his wife Joan in the head before stabbing them both repeatedly. Mullen then returned to the cabin where Kathy Francis lived 
where he proceeded to shoot her and her two young sons, aged just four and nine. There were signs that they had also been stabbed post-mortem, suggesting an extremely violent and chaotic attack. Just two weeks later, Mullen spotted four teenage boys camping in a state park in Santa Cruz. In a later confession, he admitted to pretending to be a park ranger and approaching them. Mullen told them they were camping illegally and that they needed to leave. When the boys dismissed Mullen, he left, only to come back the next day with his gun and shot them one by one in the head. Mullen's final murder occurred on February 13th, 1973. While out driving, he spotted 72-year-old Fred Perez, who was gardening at his home. Acting almost out of compulsion, Mullen pulled over to the side of the road, took out a rifle and placed it on the hood of his car. In full view of the neighbours, Mullen shot Fred Perez once in the chest and drove off. Shortly after, a docile Mullen was pulled over by the police and arrested. The authorities would later find evidence of his involvement in all of the prior crimes, bringing the total to 13 murders. But there were several factors that prevented the police from recognising patterns in the four-month murder spree Mullen had embarked on, including the fact that the murders didn't appear to be connected by a similar weapon or MO. The victims also differed so much from one another in terms of age, race and sex. While Mullen's seemingly random, frenzied attacks may have delayed the police from recognising a pattern, it was also his impulsive and disorganised nature that led to him eventually being caught. In practice, the organised-disorganised theory actually has little scientific evidence to back it up. However depraved and evil their actions may be, serial killers are complex human beings and so they often won't fit into neat categories like organised and disorganised. Professor David Cantor tested these classifications by reviewing the records of 100 serial killers. Unsurprisingly, they found that all of the murderers they reviewed were mostly organised in their approach. And, given that serial killers are repeat offenders who typically manage to evade arrest or identification for extensive periods of time, it isn't surprising that most fit into the organised category. Professor Cantor also found that while disorganised features were less common, they were present to some degree in almost all of the subjects they reviewed. Even the examples of Ted Bundy and Herbert Mullen highlight this issue, in that neither of them fit perfectly into their respective categories. Ted Bundy did commit frenzied attacks and only learnt to become more organised over time, while Herbert Mullen specifically sought out his old high school friend Jim Ralph and likely planned to kill him ahead of time, suggesting some level of premeditation and planning. So, while trying to put serial killers into separate categories might not work, it's more useful to look at it holistically and recognise that there will likely be organised and disorganised traits or features in each serial killer. 